Good morning, everyone. I'm going to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Camilla Martin. Dr. Camilla L. Martin was raised in a military family and has lived all over the United States and in Japan. She completed high school in Albany, Georgia, then entered Georgia Southern University as a first-generation college student. Graduate, graduating cum laude with a BA in English in December 2000. Her fear of the corporate workforce compelled her to pursue a career in higher education. She went on to earn a master's degree in Afro-American studies from the University of California, Los Angeles in 2003. Moving directly into a doctoral program, Dr. Martin earned her final degree in English from Florida State University in 2006. Her area of focus is 20th century African American literature with an emphasis in folklore and more specifically, the African American conjuring tradition. Her dissertation earned the FSU Department of English J. Russell Reaver Award for Outstanding Dissertation in American Literature or Folklore. Dr. Martin's research explores the lower cycle of the conjure woman or black priestess as an archetype in literature and visual texts. In 2013, Hal Gray Macmillan published her first monograph, Conjuring Moments in African American Literature, Women, Spirit Work, and Other Such Hoodoo, which engages how African American authors have shifted, recycled, and reinvented the conjure woman figure primarily in 20th century fiction. Dr. Martin's talk today will focus on envisioning black feminists, voodoo aesthetics, African spirituality, and American cinema. Her most recent publication on a Lexington 2016 press, which explores the treatment of the priestess figure in American cinema. Dr. Martin has held faculty positions at Georgia State University, the University of Houston, and is currently an associate professor of African American literature at Savannah State University. Also, Dr. Martin recently um, won an award for her book that well, she's talking about today from the College Language Association for Creative Scholarship. So we'd like to welcome, a warm welcome for Dr. Martin to the University of Houston again to talk to her about her latest publication. Good morning to everyone. It's so good to be back at the University of Houston. Uh, this place uh, holds a special, special place in my heart. I actually did the bulk of writing for this book while I was here as a visiting uh, scholar at the University of Houston. And you know, Dr. Turner showed a little bit of money to help me with the publication cost for this book. So it's good to kind of come back full circle and be able to talk about this book as it's completed um, uh, to you all. Okay. Um, so this project is an attempt to address a curious thing that I noticed when watching film and television. I've always been drawn to the supernatural, particularly as it relates to women. I like the witches and you know, all of that good stuff. Uh, but I began to see a pattern of black women performing so-called black magic and began to question what was at the heart of such representation. What is the correlation, I was asking myself, between popular film, black women, and African spirituality? Why are black women, like the character of Tia Dalma in the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise, uh, who are engaged in spirit work, also assumed to be purveyors of evil, right? These are questions that I seek to answer in Envisioning Black Women's Google Aesthetics my book here, uh, which critically evaluates the use of African-based spiritual traditions as a cinematic motif in contemporary American film. I focus on the characterization of the black female ritual specialist, uh, often referred to as Mambo or Conjure Woman, the Obia Lady, uh, Grandma and Auntie, right? We were all familiar with, with this particular ar archetype. Um, the Black Priestess, as I will refer to her today, is a black Atlantic iteration of traditional medicine men and fetish priests found in traditional West African nations. She has served as a spiritual advisor, 
and cultural bearer and folk healer across, across the Atlantic world since the age of enslavement. Okay? Um, and has since evolved into a type of heroine recalled in the folk tales, personal narratives, fiction, and mythologies of transnational communities across the African diaspora. So here we have four images uh, of some figures, some black priestess figures uh, from history that you might be familiar with. Uh, can anyone tell me who that is on the $500 note there? Does anybody know who that is? You don't know. <laughs> that is Nanny of the Windward Maroons. She is a Jamaican national hero, right? If you don't know about Nanny of the Windward Maroons, uh, you should find out. Okay, again, she is on the uh, $500 uh, note there um, uh, in Jamaican currency. Uh, we also have Madame Marie Laveau, uh, the, the heralded voodoo queen of New Orleans. Uh, next, we have um, the book cover of Maurice Conde's uh, story, I Tichuba. You might be familiar with Tichuba, Indian of the Salem witch trials, right? These are all historical figures, right? And last, we have. Um. Oh, you know that one, right? Mama Odie. Mama Odie from The Princess and the Frog, which will be, I'll focus a, a, a good bit on Mama Odie today as, as we kind of talk about who this figure is and what's happening to her on the big screen. Okay. For women of African descent, the feminine divine reflect the place and import of women within a black transnational cosmology. The black woman as priestess is simultaneously the homeopath, the nurturer, the griot, the keeper of the tale, the diviner, having an undeviating connection to the invisible world by mere virtue of her gender, or at least that's what I argue, right? This concept is best articulated by Zora Neale Hurston uh, when she happens upon the divine mystery of the black priestess in Tell My Horse, uh, which is a collection of her folklore uh, coming out of Jamaica and Haiti, particularly studying the Vodun uh, tradition, okay? When asked, Hurston tells us, what is truth? In ritual, the mama replies by throwing back her veil and revealing her sex organs. The ceremony means that this is the infinite, the ultimate truth. There is no mystery beyond the mysterious source of life. Continuing in her fervor to respond to the symbolic question, the mama discards six veils in advance and falls at last naked and spiritually intoxicated to the ground. It is considered the highest honor for all males participating in participating to kiss the organ of creation, for Dambala, the god of gods, has permitted them to come face to face with the truth. So to call attention to the black priestess archetype is to recognize the multiple roles, the versatility, and the African heritage of such women who are engaged in a curative transformation of reality. Rather than the stigmatized concepts of black magic and evil, African spirituality practiced by Africana women has been an empowering concept for many black women as it pays homage to an African past while providing a present day idiom for magic and power and ancient wisdom within a pan-African cultural context. This is readily proven in the 21st century by the celebrity of African-American Yoruba priestess, Iyanla Vincent. Got to know Iyanla was getting down like that, did you? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, she, she's definitely doing more than practicing Christianity, right? Indeed, the black priestess is still among us, flourishing and fighting the good fight, as modernity dictates. I singularly focus on the female ritual specialist to both narrow the scope of the project and engage in a gendered line of inquiry. Uh, so, voodoo aesthetics, what is that, right? Um, the inscription of African ritual cosmologies on the black female body, what I am terming voodoo aesthetics, has been deployed in visual media for varying purposes. Voodoo aesthetics has become manifest in the performance of ceremony on film, uh, the inclusion of sacred objects or accoutrements on the body, the use of the body itself as a vessel for spirit and various other associations between persons of African descent and African religious iconography. Snippets of the black priestess's likeness and applications of voodoo aesthetics are discernible in a score of American film titles. A few notable examples are listed here, right? And this is by no means exhaustive, right? Um, but my research starts in the 1930s and looking at some of the earliest 
uh, manifestations of the black priestess on film and goes up to 2009, okay? Um, so here's just an example of all the films that are, are, are participating in these voodoo aesthetics. The portrayal of the priestess, the black priestess in these films, moves from gross stereotype to reverence, and even teeters on ambivalence in some cases. Envisioning black feminist voodoo aesthetics seeks to place the genre of film in conversation with black feminist criticism to explore the representations of the priestess figure in popular imagination. I am troubled, to say the least, by what mainstream cin cinema deems knowable and truthful about black women in spirit work, and thus find it necessary to probe this question further. The way in which blue aesthetics are inscribed on the black female body tends to shape a dialogue in which the, the, the cultural knowledge about black women is informed and constructed. As with the spiritual traditions of Obia, Conjure, and Voodoo, visual media also partakes in both a healing and harming practice. Film can restore damaged and accurate expressions or uh, perpetuate prejudice, stigmatized ideals that become more difficult to challenge, right? When we think about film and black women and spirit work, um, how many of us can think of images where these women are portrayed positively? Okay? Think about that. The black priestess archetype is such a long standing as a cultural icon, for better or for worse, particularly in American consumer markets, that it was destined that multimedia giant the Walt Disney Company would take a sip of her brew. Her likeness is reflected in three Disney feature films released in the 21st century Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest, which is the second installment, uh, and Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. Okay, and as well, The Princess and the Frog, which came out in 2009. Disney's appropriation of women in spirit work signals a haunting, a halting moment for the black priestess. Her popular evolution uh, finds itself at a crossroads, where in the path she follows will have significant repercussions for the future, I argue. So what happens when the priestess of Africana religion uh, is placed in the hands of Disney, who has a sordid history of piracy in another context? Today's presentation uh, it employs a close reading of the voodoo aesthetics and performance of African spirituality by women of color in Disney, and actually I'm only going to talk about Mama Odin, uh, to underscore how Disney's misinformation, or mis me, misinformed usage of cultural material perpetuates ignorance and strips symbols of their cultural value when misappropriated for entertainment. Okay? So in the aftermath of its much anticipated commercial release, I experienced a good bit of disappointment uh, with the voodoo subtext of The Princess and the Frog. And then I'm going to offer these preliminary notes on Disney's latest venture into voodoo. Disney's manipulation and, and exploitation of voodoo is unfortunately consistent with the coming out of its first African American princess. Uh, the Princess and the Frog ultimately reads as a reification of the classic Cinderella tale. Uh, albeit insisting that wishing on stars and kissing frogs are for Princess Tiana's fairer counterpart, i.e. white women, right? Uh, the subtext of the film expresses a clear distinction between black and white princesses. That is, if you're a black girl and you want happily ever after, you better work hard and keep your head out of the clouds. Voodoo is employed in the film more as a means to accentuate the setting of New Orleans as the voodoo capital of the world, right? Rather than desire or redirect popular misconceptions about spirit work. Likewise, Mama Odie is a gimmick, a fill-in for the requisite fairy godmother, who is called upon to magically rescue the oppressed white woman by enchanting the right, by which I mean financially robust, uh, romantic interest to notice her distressed situation, right? Mama Odie is billed in the advertisement for the film as Tiana's, Tiana's Bayou Fairy Godmother. That title, I argue, is, is a ploy to lessen Mama Odie's association with African spirituality. Voodoo practice is reserved for Dr. Facilier and is portrayed as dark and evil in the film. Uh, to deepen Mama Odie's affiliation by referring to her as a voodoo fairy godmother is to blur the very clean line between good and evil that Disney demarcates in its deployment of voodoo, right? Uh, Disney appears oblivious to the Haitian folk expression which chides us that 
There are no good and evil spirits in voodoo, only powerful ones. Right? Mama Odie, the blind voodoo lady who lives in a boat in a tree in the bayou, has only one major sequence in the film and doesn't really perform any voodoo rites or ceremonies other than divination in her magic tub of gumbo um, and shape-shifting her pet snake, Juju. But she offers conventional wisdom to her amphibian clients, Tiana and Amin, urging them to dig a little deeper to heal their earthly woes rather than seeking divine intervention through the Loa, who are non-existent in the film, uh, or other healing rites. And the Loa are, that's the, the, the Haitian term for, um, you may be familiar with the term Orisha in the Yoruba tradition. Uh, the Loa is a similar concept in the Voodoo tradition. Okay? Um, she empowers both characters to realize their power and right to self-determination, much in the same way that Miranda Day urges Bernice to channel positive energy and good health in order to conceive in Mama Day, or the way that Big Mama might tell you, you know, a hard head makes a soft behind, right? She's not really doing anything supernatural or out of the ordinary, right? Uh, Mama Odie is nurturing, right? She's a nurturing maternal elder who uses mother wit and a little bit of divination to convey to Tiana that her plight can be resolved with patience, faith in herself, and introspection. She functions in the traditional capacity of the madrina, or mentoring spiritual elder within African spiritual systems such as Regla de Ocha and Voodoo, more so than the Eurocentric Babadine fairy godmother in the Cinderella, Cinderella fairy tale. Mama Odie pushes her charges to look within themselves for strength and humility rather than offering a magical temporary escape mechanism through magic. One might argue that Mama Odie's role in Tiana's life is no different than that of the revered big mama of the African American community. Well, one can appreciate Disney's incorporation of voodoo in its depiction of New Orleans, the insight and wisdom imparted by Mama Odie could just as easily have been conveyed by an elder or ancestor figure who had no knowledge or affiliation with New Orleans voodoo. Mama Odie's actions do not necessarily single her out, excuse me, single out her position as voodoo queen. That is, none of her behavior is exclusive to the voodoo pantheon uh, or the priesthood. Mama Odie as the voodoo queen seems rather superfluous and contrived for the singular purpose of exploiting New Orleans' historical connection to the diaspora religion, much in the same way that voodoo is lauded as a popular tourist attraction for the city. Voodoo in The Princess and the Frog functions as a plot device through which the heralded West, Western Cinderella narrative is reconfigured to relate to an ethnic audience. Aesthetically, however, Mama Odie's bayou environment pulls together some African-retained ritual paraphernalia, such as the Asan, the white ritual attire she wears, and her tree house that doubles as a glass bottle tree. Okay? Maya Durin defines the Asan as the sacred rattle of the Ungan and Mambo. These are the traditional terms for the priest and priestess um, in Haitian. It consists of a calabash, which has a handle rope and is either filled with seeds or snake vertebrae or is covered with a loose web of beads and vertebrae. It is usually used in conjunction with a small bell and for ceremonial purposes only. It should be carefully distinguished from the cha-cha, right, or the maracas, uh, a seed-filled calabash whose function is percussive accompaniment to dances. Joseph Murphy takes this description a bit further clarifying that at their initiation, the Hungan or Mambo are said to take the Asan, the sacred rattle, which is at once an emblem of office and a ritual tool. The Asan is positioned in a certain way and shaken in certain rhythms to control the direction of the energy of the Loa's presence. In his or her ceremonial setting, the Hungan or Mambo is thus conducting the invisible energies for the instruction and edification of the congregation. That Mama Odie wields the Asan, right? You see that here in the, the first picture. Um, is to advise <coughs> her that she has an elevated position within the voodoo priesthood. Uh, in her opening scene, in which she uses the Asan to vanquish Dr. Facilier's army of shadows, is the only moment that we see her use a sacred item ritually to control the shadowy entities, which may or may not be representative of the Loa. Point I will return to momentarily. 
Unfortunately, Mama Odin's son is used more as a walking stick in the cartoon than as an object with which to communicate with the invisible world. Right? So we see her use it as, as a walking stick and not really for ritual purposes. Uh, but it's there nonetheless to kind of signal for those who know that Mama Odin is associated with voodoo. She wears a white dress and covers her head in a white tignon. This is aesthetically accurate for rituals in Regla de Ocho, Regla de Ocha, and Voodoo, and the like. White is a ritual color, and it is used in various ways. New initiates of Ifa, the black and the black Atlantic religions that derive from it, or the Iyawo are to wear ritual white for the entire first year of their initiation. Additionally, the Ila Orisha, or white, or priestess of the Orisha, uh, wear ritual white during ceremony as a color, of, as white is a color that attracts spirits and is necessary when conducting a ceremony. The head of the practitioner is usually covered to prevent wayward spirits or subordinate Orisha and Loa from mounting the initiate during ritual. One keeps the head covered to protect his or her Ori, or spiritual faculty with which the physical head of, of every individual. Within the context of the cartoon, however, there's not any reference or allusion to which Loa or Orisha may be the master of Mama Odi's head. Furthermore, I am doubtful that the animators fully understood the function of, of head covering within the ritual space of African-derived religion. Mama Oni's Tignon is more so an allusion to the historic and fashionable headdress of women of color who walk the streets of New Orleans. I do not believe it serves any deeper function than to aesthetically associate Mama Odi with voodoo in general and to the history of the Tignon in New Orleans more specifically. And I can tell you a little bit about that in our Q&A part. Perhaps the most ostentatious of Mama Odi's aesthetic voodoo aesthetics employed in Princess and the Frog is the gigantic glass bottle tree that doubles as her home hidden in the bayou. Mama Odi's home is situated in a very large tree located in the most remote part or wetlands of Louisiana. Uh, Mama Odi's home is a wooden ship that, by way of flood or perhaps temperamental tides, ended up finds itself shipwrecked in the branches of this majestic oak tree. And the upper branches of the tree, and even inside the boathouse, hang glass bottles of various colors and shapes. The glass bottle tree, according to Robert Ferris Thompson, is an African retention from the Congo. The practice of attaching or tying glass bottles to tree limbs as a means to ward off bad spirits or to invoke the protection of the ancestors has been observed in the Caribbean and in the American South. Texas, South Carolina, Virginia, Mississippi, Alabama, and Arkansas in particular. It is a place where the ancestors can be remembered and honored. That is the function of the glass bottle tree. Okay. This may well be the function of Mama Odie's glass bottle tree house. The evidence is inconclusive, as the film makes no mention of why these glass bottles are attached to the tree or what they signify. This sort of rendering of voodoo aesthetics without the proper context for understanding the ritual or spiritual importance of the object promotes misunderstanding at best and exoticization at worst. The usage of the glass bottles ad nauseum in the scene is nonetheless visually pleasing. It's a nice scene to look at, right? She's singing and there's a whole, this whole musical number, right? It's nice. The bright colors catch the eye of the viewer just as actual glass bottles and ornamentation are meant to catch the flash of the spirit. But unless the viewer has this particular context in which to place the glass bottles, right, the image is devoid of any lasting meaning and functions only to position Mama Odi's spiritual practice as exotic and other. To further invoke New Orleans' syncretic past, Mama Odi's character signifies on the Crescent City's most beloved Guduin. Marie Laveau. It cannot be coincidental that Mama Odie is 200 years old, and Laveau, also known as the Little Paris, is rumored to have been born in the 18th century and lived to see the dawn of the 20th, if she ever died at all. Right? If you have any connections to New Orleans, then you know that some people say Marie Laveau never died. That Mama Odie's closest companion is a sizable python, her seeing eye snake, called Juju, also comes to my, calls to mind the legendary tales of Laveau uh, as voodoo queen of New Orleans. Uh, she was known for carrying around and performing in Congress Square with a python. 
Uh, Mama Odie's role in The Princess and the Frog, which emphasizes the healing aspect of voodoo's healing, harmony, duality, is minimal, which is, again, suggestive of Disney's appropriation of voodoo and New Orleans to propel its first African-American princess into the pop culture spotlight. Dr. Facilier, however, the antagonist of Tiana and the Bean, is more present in the film and similarly conjures memories of historic Dr. John with his name and implied professional rivalry with Mama Odie. The good Dr. Divine yeah. with yellow cards and exhibits his high conjuring skills of human transformation, apothecary, and communication with his friends on the other side. If Mama Odie represents the madrina, or godmother, with her ritual white in a song, then Dr. Facilier functions as the other side of the voodoo coin, representing the bokor, or one who practices with the left hand. You might be familiar with that phrase. Though he is not a female practitioner, his presence in the film uh, garners attention as he represents along with Mom, alongside Mama Odie uh, the separation of the healing and harming elements of voodoo, which are not always as separate as Disney would have its viewers believe. Karen McCarthy Brown waxes poetic in her elucidation of what it means to work with the left hand. She says, the work of the left hand can signify nothing more sinister than the religious practices of my neighbor as opposed to those I follow. Or it can indicate what Haitians believe to be the most destructive type of spiritual action, sorcery. Sorcery stands in contrast to the full range of ways it is possible to serve spirits within voodoo. She continues her explanation, explaining that the Haitian understanding is that groups do not practice sorcery, but individual persons who are vengeful, ambitious, and greedy do practice it. The energy put into sorcery tends to backfire, causing harm to innocent people. It stands to reason, then, that Dr. Facilier functions in the role of Bokor, as his character description positions him as one who yearns to spread darkness and corruption and become fantastically wealthy in the process. Dr. Facilier notably practices the craft alone and intentionally targets Prince Naveen and his footmen as the perfect dupes for his trick. He expects to gain considerable remuneration and makes no pretense about it. Mama Odie, however, also seems to practice alone, though her work is not associated with the left hand. Dr. Facilier employs a trickster ideology to entrap Naveen in his sinister game, which is quite possibly the reason why his character visually invokes the most boisterous trickster figure in the Gede family of spirits, Beryl Sondi. McCarthy Brown characterizes Beryl Sondi as the head of the Gede spirits, a family of spirits of the dead, or Loa, and as such, is also the master of the cemetery. He is envisioned most often wearing a dark suit with sunglasses, sitting with his legs crossed, and smoking a cigar. The colors black and purple seem to be most associated with the iconography of Baron Sondi, as, well as, as well as his infamous top hat and the skull and crossbones pictogram. Dr. Facilier bears the crossbones superimposed on his top hat, unequivocally aligning him with the spiritual entity known as Beryl Sandi, and reiterates a link to the cross and crossroads. Notably, Dr. Facilier boasts of his friends on the other side. Um, excuse me. As guardian of the cemetery, Beryl Sandi's specialty is communicating with the living and the dead, as graveyards are a place of ready contact with the ancestors. Notably, Dr. Facilier boasts of his friends on the other side, which one familiar with the spiritual concepts of African spirituality might really interpret as spirits of the dead and perhaps the Loa. The film doesn't really tell us who these friends on the other side are. Right? Uh, Joan Diane explains how Dr. Facilier's friends on the other side are accessible in the worldview of Haitian worldview. Um, for Haitians who serve the spirits, there is no beyond in the Christian sense, right? No real sense of heaven and hell, right? Um, there is no redemptive surcrease of sorrow, but rather an uncertain realm of obligation, of broken but obstinate communication between the living and the dead. 
In this capacity, barrel sum D is a formidable spirit. If an outsider is causing trouble for the family, barrel sum D is the perfect one to ask for help. In serious cases, he can send an avenging ghost. In the repertoire of spirit caused sicknesses, one of the worst conditions is having a monk, one of the dead, sent to you. And the audience observes Facilier's necromancy in this regard when he sends his army of shadows, uh, apparitions from the invisible world, to find the escapes from the beam and Tiana. Necromancy, however, is just one of the inscriptions of voodoo aesthetics for Dr. Facilier. Under Baron Sun D's sign, the malevolent vocal may take the shape of an animal and men may be transformed, Maya Dorian instructs. Here, in his dark phase of his powers, the trickster becomes a transformer. Thus, we witness Dr. Facilier transform Naveen into a frog and his footman, Lawrence, into Naveen's doppelganger. Facilier invokes another association with the dead, crossroads, and trickster spirits. It cannot be overlooked that he literally barters his soul uh, in exchange for the powers he welds over the living. He offers all the wayward souls your little dark heart desires to the gigantic mat that embodies the nameless, speechless spirit with whom he's negotiating. Yet it's understood that if he does not uphold his part of the bargain, he will forfeit his life. This ominous depiction of the dead as being mollified by the promise of souls, wayward or otherwise, corrupts how the ancestors and the loa function within African spirituality. The Loa are not eager to collect spirits. They receive no benefit from such action. Rather, the spirits of the deceased humans return to the invisible world and continue to serve and protect their family as ancestors. The bartering of souls, however, does signify on the legend of Robert Johnson, blues guitar, guitarist extraordinaire. This Faustian tale is merged with classic voodoo references from the US occupation period. Um, in the Disney animated film. Uh, the classic voodoo, excuse me, particularly taking care to invoke William Seabrook's account of the voodoo wanga, or as Dr. Facilier calls it, talisman. There are several scenes in which Dr. Facilier demonstrates his voodoo prowess, but I am particularly struck by the images of him blowing a purple hued powder in the air or face of his unsuspecting victims. He does this at the very beginning uh, when he's introduced, and he does it again, uh, he blows the powder in the face of Tiana, um, which causes her to kind of elus uh, hallucinate. Um, the action, I argue, is introduced to the American public in William Seabrook's travelogue, uh, The Magic Island. published in 1929. Um, he goes to great lengths to describe the powerful wanga used in Haitian voodoo practice. Uh, William Seabrook is a white man, a uh, journalist, who decides that he's going to go over to Haiti and find out all of the voodoo secrets. Right. So he writes this book in 1929 uh, that is very uh, uh, sensational um, and very exploitative, to say the least. Right. Um, so he talks about this wanga he sees uh, this voodoo priestess make, um, and he, he describes it, um, this love charm. The dried powder of a hummingbird she mixed with, with uh, dried drops of her grandson's blood, also his semen, likewise the pollen of jungle flowers. When all this had been duly ground together into dust-like fineness, she transferred it into a leather, leather pouch made from the scrotum of a goat. More importantly than the ingredients of the wanga, however, is the way in which the spell is cast on the intended love interest. Seabrook tells us, as T. Marie swayed past him laughing, he threw the dust full in her face, and that half blinded her with the dust in her eyes and her nostrils and her mouth, and she spat like a young wildcat. We see this allusion to Seabrook performed in The Love Wanga, a film from 1936, uh, as well as uh, by actress Angela Bassett in her role as, as Marie Laveau in the series American Horror Story, The Cousin. There are several scenes where she's blowing powder in the face of some unsuspecting person, right? 
Um, so Dr. Facilier, uh, in an attempt to coerce Tiana into returning his Wanga to him safely, blows this purple dust in her face the same way that Seabrook described in 1929. Dr. Facilier's power of transformation and deceit, um, actually I'm gonna move ahead just a little bit. Um, I have a couple other pictures that I wanna show, but I'll, I'll just try to walk through that quickly. Um, so, so I'm kind of walking through and describing how um, how Dr. Fusilier comes to his, his end, right? So we, we see, again, his, his talisman here. That is where, that is his source of power, right? So he communicates with these spirits and says, you know, put this, give me, give me your power, um, and I'll make sure you get all the souls that you want. And so when Tiana is able to grab the talisman from him, uh, he, becomes, he becomes weakened, right? Um, and eventually she smashes the talisman. And those same friends that we, we saw him negotiating with are really the ones who, who kind of do him in, right? His friends on the other side. Uh, I argue that perhaps Beryl Sondi has come from uh, the invisible world to kind of collect this debt from Dr. Facilier. Um, and so we see him being dragged here through the cemetery um, and eventually kind of being sucked into this, this above ground tomb. Um, and we, we find him, which I think is pretty ironic, right, because Beryl Sondi is uh, his home is in the cemetery, we see Dr. Facilier um, kind of caught into this tomb, which is one of the major symbols for, for Meryl Sondi. Uh, so that's kind of an uh, uh, ironic twist here, all right? Uh, and I want to mention just a few other of the voodoo aesthetics that, that take place in, that are used in Princess and the Frog. Um, so if you notice the chalk drawings on the floor here, I want to talk about those. Is anybody familiar with what those are called? No? In the Haitian tradition, they are referred to as the Veve. Um, so I, want, I do want to kind of take a look at it. I want to, I want to explain what, what those are. Um, the sacred symbols of the Loa, right? Every Loa has its own Veve uh, or symbol, are rendered as colorful dancing animations that provide Dr. Facilier with the necessary pomp and circumstance to impress his clients with his parlor tricks. The veve are the most intimate and the most common art form in the old and venerable religion, yet they lose their significance when Disney invokes them, uh, though they are only emblematic and they're not the actual <coughs> symbols, um, out of ceremonial context and the purpose uh, of sensational special visual effect. In my estimation, with the superfluous dancing veves and voodoo dolls, I also talk about the drum, right? So here we see each drum has a separate veve, uh, that's supposed to reference it, one of the voodoo spirits. We also see uh, the veves on the wall kind of dancing up in these kind of fireworks display. We see the superstitious voodoo dolls that are dancing, and they're actually beating on the drums. Um, and I don't think I have to emphasize to you how much, how important the drum is in African ceremony. The drumming and the dancing is what actually brings the spirits down, right? So when we talk about spirit possession, and uh, able for that to happen, drumming is taking place, uh, ritual dancing is taking place, and the veves are drawn on the floor um, to kind of announce which spirit they are trying to, to bring down, okay? Um, so in my estimation, the superfluous dancing veves and voodoo dolls, uh, voodoo could not be more, of a ma uh, be more manufactured for public consumption than in, than in, in Disney's characterization. Uh, Disney visually summons all of the stereotypical images associated with sensational voodoo to make Dr. Facilier a believable villain. He lacks only the ubiquitous zombie um, for which the army of shadows gladly sit in with its eerie howls and blind submission to the will of the Bokor. Okay, so kind of returning back to, to, to um, my overall conversation about um, black women and spirituality. Right. So what we see in uh, what I argue about the Princess and the Frog is that you know um, Disney really kind of strips Mama Odie of her cultural power and significance. Um, she's really no more than you know somebody's somebody's grandmother here. We don't really see her performing the type of healing work or, or, or giving the type of spiritual guidance that would normally uh, be the realm of the, the black female priestess. Um, and so I, I think that there are um, you know. 
Disney is actually um, doing a lot of damage to, to Rudy in, in this, this sense. It really kind of takes it out of its cultural context. Um, there's no explanation for why these things are happening. It's just kind of thrown on, on the screen. And we, we see too much of that, I argue, um, in, in Disney films. I argue the same thing for, for Tia Dama's character in uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, not only that, but, but Tia Dama also gets sexualized, hypersexualized. Right? She's, she's, she's growling and, 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 and purring and flirting with, with Jack Sparrow and Will Turner. And then she has this thing with um, David Jones, right? And so, so I argue that these are some really problematic images of black women performing spirit work, right? So rather than Tia Doma and um, Mama Odie, um, I, I think that these characters would be more recognizable and have more power um, by using or connecting them to, to some of the, the actual Africana uh, female divine that we are familiar with, uh, Yemanya, Oshun, Urzuli, uh, Olokun, uh, but, but, but Disney decides to kind of completely strip that away um, and kind of create these, these female divine characters that really have no meaning outside of the Disney story. Um, right, so um, I argue that they would be wise to take Mama Odie's advice and dig a little deeper. While Tia Dama and Mama Odie are safely nestled into the history of the Walt Disney Empire, Disney proves less safe for the celebration of African-centered spiritual epistemologies carried out by women of color. It would appear that Disney is still up to its old tricks of turning other people's cultural material into the property of mice. And so I will end there, and uh, I am eager to, to hear your, your thoughts and questions, and, and let's have a conversation about voodoo and women and representation. Thank you. Especially in societies that are like culturally mixed. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I just 